floriculture, I've got a little um, introduction to the industry. And um, we're a pretty dynamic industry. It's changing a lot. And in fact, it's hard to keep up to date with all the data and stuff that I'm going to show you because it changes every year. But floriculture is defined as the cultivation of flowering plants. Pretty simple. And floriculture as a greenhouse industry and a greenhouse commodity is pretty diverse. And then we cover cut flowers, potted flowering plants, uh, foliage plants, bedding, and garden plants. Uh, even cut greens is part of the part of the group. In 2005, which is the last uh, data that, that I've got, it's, it's what I think is really sound, is that uh, the industry, the floral industry, is 19.4 billion dollars in the United States. <clears throat> when you see other industry estimates that you that are, that are published, it all depends on a great deal of things, includes what they're including in a floriculture category. Um, this is a merging of the farm gate receipts and the retail sales receipts, so there's a lot of sell-through. Um, also, some people include silk and drives in that as well. But uh, what this boils down to is, in the United States, uh, the flower industry, uh, about $55 per person is spent on the purchase of flowers. $55 per year. Floriculture sales also includes potting soil, seed, hard goods, containers, lifestyle products, because a lot of florist shops don't sell just flowers. Actually, the flowers, somebody comes in to buy flowers, they go to the shop, and hopefully maybe they'll buy a candle or a vase or something else. And um, lifestyle products, er everything from um, aromatherapy to other things. And agricultural perspectives of the farm gate value, floriculture is greenhouse and nursery crops, the third largest industry in the United States in ag, behind corn and soybeans. Of course, that's in plant ag. Uh, beef cattle is probably a lot more. Um, but we're, we sell, have a higher farm gate value than wheat, cotton, tobacco, vegetables. Um, $200 billion of the, of, in, in the agriculture industry 14 billion is nursery and greenhouse, or 7.3 percent of all agriculture. So, those of you looking at it, this as a career in agriculture, we're pretty strong. So, let's talk a little bit about how people buy flowers. And this talk is a little bit sexist. Okay, I'm going to embarrass somebody. Most of the guys. I'm going to pick on them. 78.6 people, 78.6% so of floral buyers are women. 21.4 men. Why? What's wrong with this picture, guys? We only buy flowers when we screw up. You only buy flowers <laughs> when you screw up. Okay. Ladies, when do you want flowers? All the time. Not when you screw up. Okay. My wife would say this statistic is wrong because I screw up more than 21.4% <laughs> of the time. <laughs> are over 55. Guys, a lifetime of screwing up. Okay. Hey, Ashley. 31.6 have graduated from college. Can I see where I'm going? Thirty-eight percent of all female floral consumers are employed full time. Most floral consumers come from two member households. That includes all partnerships. Okay? More members in the household, it goes down pretty markedly, doesn't it? Because they don't have any money, they're, they're feeding their kids, right? Okay. So most people are dual income households. 
and most consumers have an income of over $75,000 a year. These are United States statistics. It's kind of backwards in Europe. So what's the deal? Flowers are a what kind of purchase? Affluent empty nesters. Over 55, $75,000 a year, two-person household. I can't, I can't wait to be an empty nester. <laughs> are you? It's wonderful. It's wonderful? Okay. Affluent empty nesters. Okay? What this means is people that buy flowers has discretionary income. Discretionary income. Most are female. Women are more likely to buy plants at a discount chain, at the grocery store, at Walmart, wherever they're going. Because it's what kind of a purchase? It's an impulse buy. Okay? Impulse buy. Women buy flowers on impulse. Men buy flowers from street vendors, flower shops, and convenience stores, the gas station. How many of you ever bought roses on the corner of the interstate I-25 in Denver? Those guys have messed up. They're late for they're late going home or they've had too much to drink or who knows what. Okay. <laughs> guys are more likely to buy from a flower shop. Women are more likely to buy from a, from a grocery store. Impulse versus I screwed up. What's the number one flower selling day of the year? Valentine's Day? Wrong. Mother's Day. Day after Valentine's Day. <laughs> the forest call it doghouse day. Okay? If you want something funny, there's a really cute J.C. Penny ad, and it's on a website called doghouse.com, or go to the doghouse guy, or something like this, and it's really cute. But it talks about that. So, it's an affluent buy. Usually, somebody that's got a little bit of discretionary income. In Europe, they buy flowers, fresh flowers, all the time. Maybe because they're latitude of the Hudson Bay and it's dark so much of the year. But it's a different attitude. Alright. Flowers in the workplace. Flowers and plants in the workplace. Um, increased fluency or productivity. What would flowers in the workplace do to men? Can you do that? Three flowers on a table make you work better? It does. Gives you more imagination. Females gives a little bit of an impact. The lack thereof, though, really cuts down the workplace. This is an interesting research project that was conducted at Texas A&M in their landscape architecture program. Seniors <coughs> receiving flowers. Excited smile. This is a, the study they went and took flowers. They took flowers into a nursing home and they gave it to gave it to senior women and senior men um, as a surprise gift. And other gifts, it was a candle, a scented candle. Wow, young. Got a little bit of a <laughs> smile, but it's still. So. How do people spend their money on flowers? $19.4 billion in sales, $50 a person. 39% of that is on fresh cut flowers, 11% flowering plants, green plants, 5%, outdoor garden, this is ready plants, 40% artificial drying. So this is pretty much schematic of what people buy in this country. No surprise, most people buy bedding plants. In dollar value, um, cut flowers is right behind. Yes, Matt. Uh, what would green plants be? Green plants, uh, foliage, uh, house plants. Okay, interior scape. A 
And like I said, flower purchases are limited to cultures that have discretionary income. And that's money that's available for things other than food and clothing and shelter. And where we have flower sales are in countries that have a high standard of living. Europe and Japan sell more flowering plants than any place else in the world. And in fact, these countries all sell more blooming flowering plants than the United States. Switzerland is number one, most economic, most affluent society in the world. Switzerland. Norway, Netherlands, Denmark, and Germany. Okay. The United States is behind them. So, bedding plants is the major thing in the United States. And the market, the biggest market value for bedding plants is things like impatiens, petunias, pansies. This is a lump, vegetable seed, just to kind of give you an idea. An I, a value of what is being sold as bedding plants. That's the biggest crop. Potted flowering plants, I don't know why they, they, they put perennials in here, I would put them as bedding plants, but you see in dollar value, orchid is way up there. Okay? And this is a typo, this is actually poinsettia. That. So this is it's actually point seven. So orchid actually in dollar value represents greatest number of sales in the United States and poinsettias, poinsettia opportunity is behind that now, but in number of units sold, poinsettias is number one. In cut flowers, dollar value, the greatest value is lilies, okay, primarily the wedding season. Orchids, river daisies, plums, so forth. Now in container production, thinking about bedding plants, flowering plants, cut flowers, this is a percentage of how many plants are in pots. This value here in baskets is growing, and this is what people buy in the flats. So more and more people are buying pots and baskets increased value because it's a ready-made design, okay? We have our postage stamp lots, smaller and smaller units, okay? People are looking at uh, smaller spaces, condominium buys. One of my favorite websites that I look at on a regular basis for ideas for small scale gardening is a website called On the Balcony, okay? lifeonthebalcony.com. It's fun. She does all kinds of cool things. Okay. So, pretty much that's how that works. Fresh product sales. Again, this is just a pie chart of what I showed you earlier. Bedding plants, 44, cut flowers. Okay. So where do we buy, where do flowers sold? Everybody thinks it's a retail florist. But there are street vendors. Um, you go to major cities and there's street vendors all over the place that are selling buckets of flowers and that's how people make good income. Uh, supermarket, uh, supermarket is a uh, supermarket sales of cut flowers started in the uh, mid 1980s and grew from there. Started out being managed by the produce industry. Uh, it's now pretty much uh, uh, they have their own floral floral um, groups, warehouse stores, drug stores, warehouse stores that includes things like Sam's and Costco, um, internet, internet sales. Some of the first internet sales 
in the country back in the early 1990s, when the internet bubble was just starting, the first, inter first uh, internet sales shops were florists, where you buy roses online or something like that. Okay. Uh, airports, you go to, you fly into Hawaii, there's a vending machine that you can put your money into and get your lay of somebody to give you one. Okay. Um, and then, of course, the gas station convenience stores, not so much anymore, but uh, farmer's markets, um, there's a couple ladies that sell flowers at the farmer's market here at Fort Collins. So, looking at dollar values in green versus percentage of sales, you can see that the florist generates the most dollar value, but the big box store generates the most volume in material. Okay? Uh, the direct consum consumer, that's the, that's the internet sales, but that's changing. And general retail, that's what you would consider like uh, the grocery store. So the traditional florist shop that we all think about, the florist, in florist shop industry is still uh, pretty much a mom and pop. Uh, even Palmer Flowers is a mom and pop. You know, they have several locations. Um, Sparrow and Angela uh, run the program, run the business. Uh, the, uh, do you want to be a full service florist? A full service florist means that you do floral arrangements, you do the uh, funeral market, you do the wedding market, you do the um, uh, traditional gifts of Mother's Day, these sorts of things. Uh, you want to be a bucket shop? That's what most of the wholesale house, uh, the a bucket shop is what you think of when you go to someplace like Costco or Sam's Club where these have buckets of flowers. And um, are you going to just focus on weddings? There, there's a term that the uh, industry calls a basement Betty. I think it's kind of a demeaning term. But a basement Betty is, is a woman that just does weddings. Okay. Um, funerals. Uh, funerals is a big market. Working your way into um, the funeral business is, is quite a challenge. Uh, the phrase that is the bane of all flor traditional floors is in the obituary the phrase in lieu of flowers. Okay? In lieu of flowers. Well, because do you really think flowers are a waste? You wouldn't be here if you thought flowers were a waste. Cash and carry and holiday sales, of course. There are 12,676 people for every flower shop in the country. Typical flower shop, $330,000 to $500,000 a year. Pretty much small business. Okay? Average flower shop is about $23 per customer in flower products. That's why they have to generate a lot of hard goods to make their business run. Specialty outlets, of course, distribution and sales, floor shop, garden centers, civic nonprofit. A lot of flower sales happen with civic nonprofit programs where, uh, say, a greenhouse sets up a project with Cub Scouts or, or a choir group, or something like that and they sell their plants as, a, as their fundraiser. Actually, most poinsettias now are sold, that are sold at a profit, are sold through fundraisers, okay? Farmer's market, 1-800-BUY-FLOWERS, um, so forth, so forth. Craft and specialty, this is like Michael's and Hobby Lobby and places like that. So a retail florist, in order to really stay in business in this big world of the box stores and to be an independent um, entrepreneurial type person. There are a lot of challenges that you have to do to compete. A good friend will try to visit his shop in Lodo and he specializes in B2B where uh, they do a lot of the arrangements for hotels, they do a lot of arrangements for um, uh, opening nights at the opera and opening nights at the, uh, for any of the, any of the events at the, at the Performing Arts Center, uh, working with um, lawyers and 
real estate sales, if you have fresh, fresh flowers for their customers to see when they, when their clients to come in. Um, a lot of retail real estate agents will sell, will put a bouquet of fresh flowers in their home when a family first moves into it, such as like. Um, working with professional associations uh, to know what's going on. Wire services, wire services like FGD, we'll get to that a little later. Websites, um, pool deliveries, one way to save money where you have one delivery pool from several companies, specialty sales and corporate sales, charities, product guarantees, so forth. So these are ways that uh, the independent business person stays in business, and it's not just flowers. Garden centers, the independent garden centers, um, for instance, in, in Fort Collins, independent garden centers are places like Gullies, Jordans, um, Bath, Fossil, Fossil Creek, you know, um, Fort Collins. They have, some of those actually have, used to have flower shops at some point, and actually, to Gower Garden Center down in Parker, they have a, still have a significant uh, floral operation. Home improvement stores, um, hardware stores, uh, those are typically um, the, the box stores. But you'll see plants at Ace Hardware and places like that. And there's where you see the mer mass merchandisers now. Most of the mass merchandisers are in the supermarkets. Over uh, King Super, Safeway, Albertsons, so forth. So on consumer sales, you can see that the biggest part is still the specialty, specialty business, and that the mass merchanters are coming up rapidly. Box stores, supermarkets. Retail florists. And the retail florist is uh, when you work with wire services, there are a couple different ways to think about a wire service. When I say wire service, what do you think about? Can you give me can you name a wire service? Uh, there's the one where you call basically any florist right into there. People use the California and they call the florist over there and have to make the wire service, the official wire service is, is FTD, yeah. Florals Trans World Mutual. Right? Florals Trans World Delivery. And where you would go into a flower shop and you order the flowers and be delivered across the country. Now, this concept has been around in the floral industry for many, many, many decades. And the sending florist takes the order, charges the wire fee, it's a 20% commission. From the filling florist, filling florist designs and delivers the product, required to fill it within 10% of the value of the order. It typically doesn't get anywhere close to 70% of the value of the order. Do you want to be a sending florist or a receiving florist? Sending florist or filling florist, I mean. Who's making the most money? The sender. Sending florist. Receiving the filling florist is getting screwed. But this is the way a lot of the business works. And there is a concept called order gathering. And it where the Society of American Florists, who I'm a member of, has worked really hard to make it illegal. And what an order gatherer is. You call a phone number in your phone book in Yellow Pages. You know what the Yellow Pages are? You dial that number, and they have an East Coast accent. So you may have dialed a number in for Collins, but yet it goes to another number, and you have no idea where they are. They're called order gatherers. And then they ship the orders out. Okay. 1-800-Flowers is the same thing, but they're not, they're, they're saying we're 1-800-Flowers. It's a network, okay. So what does a filling florist do to survive? Well, they have to make sure it's a good quality product. 
And what a lot of filling floors will do is they'll give a coupon when they deliver that. A coupon when they deliver that to come back to the store, and hopefully get return, repeat business. So they get repeat business through service. So it used to be pretty balanced. Some people, some florists will join multiple services, but they, they're pretty much going around. Um, you have to watch for deceptive ads, the order gatherers. Internet sales is growing. Like I said, the first internet retailer was a florist shop in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Okay. In fact, a man named John Valentine, who's a florist in Canyon City, it's, he's, he conceptualized FTD. And also the phrase, say it with flowers. That's from John Valentine, florist in Canyon City. Wholesalers, the traditional wholesale house, and we'll visit some. They bring in, uh, they serve the wholesale, the wholesale floor serves the retail floors by bringing in product. They acknowledge, they can provide some credit, uh, gather in bulk from local growers, distant producers, including a lot of offshore production, hard goods, etc. Wholesalers are consolidators, line of credit. Maybe they'll sell product on consignment. They're the ones that develop the trends. We'll visit Denver Wholesale Florist, uh, one of the oldest wholesale houses in the country, in our field trip. Some florists live out of the cooler at the wholesale house. The people that shop there every day bring in the material, develop it, and so forth. What drove the wholesale florist industry was 1950s was the advent of air shipping. Okay. concept of being able to ship by air. And when we could ship by air, we could move floral product across the country quickly, and because we're delivering a very fragile, um, fresh product. Flower imports is uh, most of the flower production now, uh, overseas production is now far in excess of what we grow in the United States as far as cut flowers. A lot of it comes from Colombia, uh, the Colombian industry started in the, in the late 1960s where the Lyndon Johnson administration sent money and consultants into Colombia to teach them how to grow carnations from CSU, from Colorado State University. And it killed the carnation industry in the United States in Colorado. Why did they go to Central America? Well, it was originally the money was supposed to spend to cut back on the cocaine production. Uh, climatic conditions in Colombia, uh, the savanna of Colombia, it's, it's about uh, 9,000 feet. Uh, the day lake changes about 15 minutes throughout the year. Um, cool nights, warm days, perfect light, perfect temperature, and very, very inexpensive labor. I did not use the word cheap. Because Latin American countries, to be successful, have to have hard working people that will come to work tomorrow. And the next day, and the next day, and the next day. You don't abuse those people. They don't come back. They don't come back in the United States either. They go flip burgers at McDonald's. So, full time year round labor, full benefits. They may be paying minimum wage at that farm where they're growing flowers, but that farm. They bring in their employees out of the center, like in Colombia, in the Savannah, Colombia, most of the farms are close to the airport, about 10 kilometers outside of town. Most people don't have a car. They have buses that go into town, pick people up. Most of them are women. If they're women, what do a lot of women in these countries have to do? They take care of children. Children come with them. The school 
at the farm. Kids getting education. And not only is there a school at the farm, there's medical care. These big farms that grow these flowers pay their employees, provide schooling for the children. Um, the companies that belong to uh, Asoco Flores, Association of Colombian Flower Exporters, also uh, provide low interest loans and uh, support for domestic abuse, to prevent domestic abuse. So, I'm not going to complain too much about it. The, farm, the governments of these countries uh, encourage flower farming to increase their export value. What does that do for a third world country? Colombia's not a third world country. I've been there. You can't watch where you go, but it's not a third world country. I watch where I go in Denver. But, why does the government want this? Why do they want to generate exports? It generates currency. And even that family, or even if they're not growing food, you're generating currency which raises their value of living. And it's actually, Columbia is closer to New York City by air than Los Angeles. In fact, it's the same, almost the same distance between Denver and Miami to Bogota. So remember, the western part of Colombia is an eastern time zone. So what has this done to our industry? You can see in pom pom mums, over the years it's, it's dropped, and the imports have increased. With carnations, even more precipitous, and roses, the primary, three primary cut flower crops are no longer produced in the United States, except at Sun Valley Farms, right? So in the world, Columbia is just a little part. Columbia says almost everything to the United States. The biggest production area is Asia. They're the next big player, China. You've heard it before. Central South America, North America, and Europe. Europeans still grow a lot of local material. But Asia is where we're starting to see most of the production. In fact, a lot of the cutting production in the United States, a lot of the cuttings that are delivered for even the annual vegetable trials, those farms, those couple of farms are in China. That's the biggest new market. Why? It generates hard currency. Production value, that's where the United States comes out. Because of the value of what we sell, and that's bedding plants. And we have bedding plants in the United States because it's got soil, and soil is not allowed to be shipped into the United States, except in a few countries in the Netherlands, a few crops in the Netherlands, because of Quarantine 37. Quarantine 37 says no plant material should be shipped into the United States in soil. So that's why they're all cut flowers or unrooted cuttings. Domestic growers, production is ahead of inflation. What that means is that in many ways, the value of a six pack of bedding plants is the same value as it was 20 years ago. So it's depreciated in its value, costs the same number of dollars. Okay. And bedding and garden plants rules. So forth. So this is probably one of my last slides I'm going to show. And this just kind of gives you a picture of how the industry has changed over the last 20, 30 years. Where in 1980, everything was pretty much uniform. Potted, potted, uh, potted uh, foliage plants or tropical plants, that was probably the biggest section. When I was in college, when I was your age, 
uh, everybody had house plants. If you're a work student, you had to have a house full of house plants. And we all had mealy bugs everywhere. And, but you can see over the years, it's scrunched down. And the bedding and garden plants has grown. Okay. If I was to split this now, back here, this is primarily, the bedding and garden plants is primarily vegetable transplants. And it grew to about here to be almost blooming stuff. But now vegetable transplants is kicking back up again. People want to grow their own food. So you need to follow the trends. Why the changes? Well, baby boomers are aging, retiring. Gardening is still the number one hobby in the United States, but it's pretty close to what? The number one hobby, number two. What do you think? If you're not a horse major, you probably know the answer. I said eating. Eating? <laughs> yeah. What do you consider a hobby? Internet time. In my house, my boys is probably way, way, way over that. Mostly changes towards bedding plants. This is where the market is, this is where the future is, and this is where you see our biggest industry inputs is into bedding plants. And this comment down here refers to 1437, which limits import of materials in the soil. And what this graphic shows is that this is our industry is consolidating. There used to be lots of little independents, but now they're consolidating into larger and larger units. One of the largest greenhouse companies in the United States is in, Fort, is in Colorado. Their home base, it's uh, Color Star Growers in Fort Lupton. They offer operations, they have two operations in Colorado, they have three oper two or three operations in Colorado Springs, and they have uh, Dallas area, excuse me. One in Fort Lupton, one in Colorado Springs, and they have one in uh, the Dallas Fort Worth area, and another one in Missouri. Um, but they keep buying up. Tagawa family is another one that's growing. Um, they grow through consolidation. And I just learned the day before yesterday that the Paul Lakey Ranch was just bought out by a Dutch firm, which makes me real sad. 